Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are going to be taking a first look at the Cold War Era Arms Race 2. Uh, this is a game that comes out on Steam today. It is made by a very small studio, I think it's a one-man shop called Alenia Digital, I believe it is. Uh, and this is the sequel to the Cold War Era Arms Race which is what I, I actually played this on the channel several years ago. Based on what I've looked at so far, this game seems to pretty much be a very similar version of the previous game. They have made some enhancements. It feels like areas around weapons development and the space race have been fleshed out a bit. Um, some definite changes to sort of the UI and the GUI and, and sort of the graphics of things. But at its core, it's the same the same Cold War game. So we're going to go ahead and jump in here and take a first look. There's no tutorial as far as I can tell. Um, there is a manual. Uh, I, I recommend you look at it because, frankly, if I'm being honest, the UI of this game is not very intuitive. Um, and I really struggled. I got, an access, I got access to this when it was kind of like part of a Steam Next Fest demo several months back, and I remember kind of late at night, and I was kind of tired, so like that's, you know, the game's defense. But I remember kind of trying to jump in, and I was like, I, I don't know what's going on here. This screen is weird. Um, I It doesn't, I don't understand what to do. Um, and so like, I recommend you check out the, the manual uh, if you're interested, at least in basic navigation or other things like that. Uh, but it's an interesting and somewhat unique game. So uh, we're going to play a new game here. We're going to play as the USSR, I think. Um, I think the last time I played this on the channel, we did as the Americans. So we'll check this out. Obviously, you have two different potential options in the Cold War. You can, you can play as the US. You can play as the USSR. You have to choose your faction leader, cabinet of ministers, um, and, uh, and there's a possibility that your government can change over the course of the Cold War as well. So we'll go with USSR. And then with the USSR or with the US, either side, you've got four potential leaders you can choose from. Every 10 years, that leadership group can change. Uh, and so you can you can get different leaders throughout time. Now, each one of these leaders has different traits or perks or benefits that do influence the game. So you can see if we were to be Stalin, we get a plus five to air, ground, and Navy firepower, which influences military conflict directly. Um, it also reduces diplomatic production costs, spy production costs, and industry construction. We could also go, or, or actually, I think that's, yeah, that's these options here. So just, just focus on the uh, option up here. This is sort of Stalin as the plus five air ground Navy firepower. Khrushchev gives you a reduction in space technology costs. Brezhnev gives you extra spies and diplomats every year in terms of the production and Gorbachev gives you increased global consequence points for five years. I don't remember if the global consequence uh, feature was in the previous game or not, but we'll, we'll look at that here once we jump in. I think for the sake of the game, especially because the game starts and you're basically like going right into the Korean War, we'll go with the Stalin option to start, I think. I think that's where we'll go. And then we kind of have an option down here below where we can choose a conservative government members, bonus for mixed political movement members, or bonus for liberal government members. So conservative government gives us addition, additional reductions in military technology plus one to military production. Mixed gives us extra diplomats, uh, which have a big influence in this game in terms of how actions occur. Or liberal government reduces spy costs, reduces diplomat costs, or re industry costs. The industry cost is tempting, but I think we're going to go out full all-out military mode. Now, there are three different ways to win this game. One of them is winning the space race, uh, which we'll look at in a moment. Another is, um, which will give you, I guess, 50 or more score. I, like, this is like converting people uh, essentially to your, your political block. Uh, enough of them more so than the enemy gets. Um, sort of kind of win the Cold War in the traditional Cold War sense of, of sort of power block building and then the third option is like if you manage to to start a coup that changes the government in either your your opposition country you know turn the u.s communist or the ussr democratic um but we're gonna go with uh, we're gonna go with easy difficulty i don't think i can actually choose medium or hard you've got to actually unlock it by beating the game uh, and you can't play the iron man mode unless you've uh, unless you've already beaten the game uh, on easy and playing at least a medium difficulty so we've got the military reduction cost, additional military production. We'll go with Stalin as well. We're going hard into the military block, and we'll go ahead and jump in here and start. 
So you can see a brief overview here at the start. It's a blue versus red competitive game to win. You need to defeat the other side before the year 2000. You can do it by following either of the three options. Spread your alliance. Every region has a map score. Once a region has joined your alliance, you gain a score. By the year 2000, a faction with the highest alliance score is considered the winner. Uh, we already mentioned cooing the other side, uh, changing its political regime, or winning militarily by nuking your opposition to ash. I believe you have to have a certain amount of, uh, of, a, of a lead in the arms race to actually be able to nuke them. Um, otherwise, you sort of would have a mutual assured destruction. So this essentially assumes winning the nuclear war. And then you also have the uh, grand campaign. You need to pass various campaign missions in different uh, games and segments. Every decade starts with an election and whatnot. So now that we're jumping in here, we have to choose our cabinet ministers. There's three of them. There's a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there's a Ministry of Defense, and there's a Ministry of Economy. Each one of these has different sort of perks, if you will. So Andre Vizhnevsky is, uh, I believe, preference of the po politician is conservative or liberal. You can see here we get 0.1 monthly support grow in alliance. We could also choose Lazar Kagnovich, and I'm sorry, guys, I'm not very good at pronouncing Eastern European names. So that may be a problem. Uh, he reduces the influence to foe alliance once per two years. Or we could go with uh, Georgi Malenkov, uh, which increases the global consequences once point, one point per five years. Uh, I guess he's considered conservative or liberal, and he does support Stalin. Um, you can see by the flag here. So I think we'll go with uh, Gior Georgi Malenkov for our first cabinet minister. Second ministry of the military, essentially, is Zhukov uh, gives you plus 10 firepower. Vasily Ch uh, Ch Chokov gives you reduction of military cost. And Clement Vorshlov gives you increased plus two in military yearly. Uh, we're going to go with uh, Zhukov uh, for our government here. And uh, then you've got the economics minister here. So we've got Nikolai Bulganin, uh, which gives you plus two score to homeland, plus one global consequence per five years. Uh, Nikolai Podgorny, uh, which is, uh, it seems like they're similar. I guess he gives plus 50 to budget yearly. And then Lerevnit uh, Beria, uh, he was sort of the, the famous henchman of Stalin who uh, was instrumental in killing people for Stalin, uh, leading, I believe he led the KGB, but he's sort of the internal internal enforcer, if you will. No cost for parades and riots. I like the idea of plus 50 to the budget. That seems like a good thing to have. So, so we go there um, and then we've chosen the bonus for conservative members only. So we get the military technology cost being reduced and plus one to military production. Um, yeah. Penalties of, of the government stagnation. If the same leader stays longer than one term reforms, if new reform laws are passed, I don't, I guess we'll see what comes of that when it comes to it. So this is a turn-based game. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's all you need to know. It's turn-based. Uh, the game starts in, I believe it's 1950. You can see here there's different map views. So you've got kind of the North America view. You've got the South America view. Uh, you can zoom in or out with the mouse wheel. Um, all these different countries. Countries that are in one particular color are part of a, a, part of a block, if you will. Um, countries, so like red countries are, you know, communist and sort of, they fill the block that way. Uh, blue countries are uh, sort of in the American block. And then the gray countries or, or no color are countries that are kind of in between or haven't necessarily picked a side yet. Uh, and, uh, and that goes back to, you know, determining score of who controls what um, within the game. So you can see up here you have multiple different options. We'll, we'll address this flag in the upper left hand, but you've got a global influence so this uh, of this faction spread all over the world, percentage compared to global influence of another superpower, which I'm assuming is just the U.S., so it's sort of 50-50 right now uh, for each side. You've got your firepower based on global influence, firepower bonus based on global influence, alliance scores, uh, global consequences, United Nations points, political action points, Here's our budget or GDP, GNP, uh, nuclear supremacy. So number of nuclear warheads, I believe, is the second number here, the 20. And then how's that? how that compares with, with the opposition here. Um, so I believe on the right is the Russians and on the left is the Americans. That's how I read that. 
Uh, meanwhile, you can see here, score the region five. So by controlling the USSR, we get five score. By controlling Poland, we get three. By controlling East Germany, we get one. Czechoslovakia is three. Hungary is two. Romania is one. Bulgaria is one. Uh, China, I'm assuming, is two or three. No, China is four. And then North Korea is one. We will be invading South Korea soon, probably, anyway. Uh, so we'll be able to delve into the military side of things here. But so where you get the option here on the bottom, increase your influence by using diplomats, increase military presence by adding military units. And I believe when both sides have military units in the same hex, uh, that, that kind of is how you trigger a war. So like there's no red units in Japan. There's no blue units in China. There's no units at all in India. So that's kind of how that factors in. And then you've got spies, espionage sort of on the right. Uh, and then in theory, if you get certain factors unlocked, you can initiate a civil war or initiate a peaceful res revolution uh, within, a, within a particular country. Um, additionally to all of that, you've also kind of got these options here. Uh, so we click on the USSR, we see there's industrialization and cooperation. Uh, we, can, we can go here and we can go to, I don't know where we would want to go, but find a country that maybe isn't in our block that we can we can try and lure in that would be valuable i don't know who's likely to actually join us probably not a whole lot of countries in europe what about uh india's worth four let's see here if we click on india you can see we could do um can we do an industrial cooperation down here we could do a diplomatic contract one diplomat will be producing yearly after construction is complete so total cost of the construction, sum of both regions multiplied. So I guess this would be more like, I don't even know if we can do that. So I could do a military industrial contract, a diplomatic contract, or an S spy network. Hmm. I don't think they would actually agree to that. So India, USSR, you have to choose two sides here. Maybe they'd agree to it. But let's do diplomatic. So you can see here, we're initiating a um, diplomatic sort of industrial or cooperation agreement. So a treaty, basically. There's also a military technologies tab here where you can actually unlock things. So you've got um, air technology here, which... This isn't like directly related to, is it a MiG-21? What does that mean? Is it a Su-27? What does that mean? Basically, this is just a progress bar of air aviation related technology. Right now, we're starting at one with the MiG-15. It can go all the way to KA-50 or I guess new weapons after, uh, after you run out of historical weapons. Um, you also have a land technology basis, which we start with the IS-2. You've got naval tech, which, you know, I've got the SSK, the Zulu, uh, nuclear weapons tech you start with sort of a, essentially our copy of the of a fat man the rds1 and then you've got um technologies for the space race and this has a lot more options where you can do things to unlock this but this goes to like the basic version of how you win sort of initially i believe in easy mode is you want to you want to win the you want to win the space race to sort of unlock all these space technologies before the americans do now, every one of these has a cost. So you can see here there's a cost of 30 gold for the, the R1 rocket. Um, and then zero, I guess, global global influence or whatnot. Um, it, like it, it, doesn't, it gives you zero global influence. Sputnik Animal Flight gives you two, plus two, uh, you know, in terms of uh, influence or, or alliance score. Um, Lunar 9 gives you two. Apollo Soyuz gives you two, and you can see, again, there's a budget cost here, a dollar amount here. Um, you can see our budget up here. We've got 2,500 gold, so obviously, you know, it's it's very early, very early in the in this, in the, in this era. So the first thing we can do is an R1 rocket, which essentially is a basic rocket engine uh, to get us into space. Uh, I believe it's kind of like a, kind of like a V2 copy, uh, but we'll go ahead and do that. Um... Or maybe it just, un I'm trying to remember how exactly that unlocks. Do I have to do any aviation stuff or nuclear stuff? Oh, yeah. Click here. I don't think I can actually do, do this down here. 
This is grayed out. This is the space race thing down here. The game's UI is not terribly great in terms of like telling you what's going on. But yeah, this is basically, this is where you are in terms of progress on these technologies down here effectively is your budget. So do you want to assign one of your, you know, political action points to increasing funding for uh, this ha Chevron here, which I believe this is just general military spending. You've got espionage, you've got um, diplomacy, nuclear tech, this sort of, oh, this is, okay, so this is the reason. We can't do the satellite stuff yet, uh, but satellite and this radar indicator are both technologies for the space race. So we'd have to do this one first before we can get to here. So, for example, I can do one of my uh, political action points here on the uh, satellite indicator here, and now we're going to spend, you know, spend 50 of our, of our money to do that. We could do a second one if we want to accelerate that research, uh, make it occur more quickly. Uh, but you know, for the moment anyway, that we're just gonna, we're just gonna do the one. Um, if we go to the, if we go to the industry side of things, like we could also, so we're military technologies, we've got space technologies, we've got diplomacy here, uh, United Nations, uh, you, you earn like sort of United Nations points that you can then use calling for peacekeepers, con condemning aggression, intervening in conflicts or give a great speech, which sort of influences other countries' willingness to, to support your side. There's also the global consequences piece, which is somewhat new to the game. Um, effectively, we start in 1950. The first decade is 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, and 90 to 2000. That's the game. In, in each one of these eras has different uh, global consequences, which are essentially like different events that can occur, which influence politics on the global stage. And so we start in 1950 and there's six different potential global consequences. The first of them being the Berlin airlift, uh, which the way this works is you get sort of a score based on if you're able to trigger different events that are good for you. So for example, if the Berlin airlift is done and it goes to the, the, you know, the, 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 USSR wins it, then it reduces opposition in East Germany, reduces influence in the American alliance for the U.S. If the U.S. gets enough global consequence points and prioritizes the Berlin airlift, then they get plus 30 U.S. influence and plus 10 opposition in East Germany, uh, negative five Soviet influence and in the Warsaw Pact, basically. The alternative is like you could choose to focus on the new way of India, which would give the U.S. additional influence in India as well as more money. Likewise, for the USSR, it could increase the USSR's influence in India and give the USSR more money. And as we saw before, India is an important nation and score value is four, Russia's five. So it's like basically India is on par with China. It's one of the most important non-aligned um, nations early on. There's also unthinkable, which I don't know if this is like meant to be actually World War Three or what it is, but you can see the US gets additional military and opposition in all Soviet states, the USSR, if it does it. And the way this w essentially works is like you commit global um, consequence points each turn. And if you get to 30, for example, and you've selected the Berlin airlift, then you, and you get to 31st, it triggers for your side. Or if you get to 91st and you're prioritizing the new way of India, then you get the, you get that one. Um, the Vietnam War is also on here. So if the U.S. does it, then the opposition in Indochina is increased. Firepower for the U.S. Uh, if the uh, if the USSR gets it, Indochina joins the Soviet alliance. So they join that that block of your country. Then there's also the Hungarian Revolution option and American Communism option as well. Um, so Vietnam War is 130. It's kind of expensive. Uh, New Way of India is 90. I'm kind of inclined to go with that. So you can see here we can go with, we've got plus three for global consequence points. We can assign one to this. Um, so we could do, like, we can choose up to three to, to assign to it. So we could do one for New Wave India. I'm actually going to do two for New Wave India and one for the Vietnam War. And that's how we'll spend our three, our three points. I feel like Hungarian might be really bad for us, but, but in any way. 
If the U.S. wins American communism, it removes our influence there, but I don't think we're going to overthrow the U.S. government anytime soon. So we'll assign the two to India and then one to the Vietnam War, um, and hopefully that helps us. And then you can see here on the budget, you've actually got like each side starts at 2500 in their GDP or their, their spending, and then it increases or decreases over time. You, know, you can see expected revenue is 192, expenditures are 132. We start with 2500. The GDP will go to 2560 based on estimates. Um, we can also choose to invest, use our political points to invest in growth. So right now we actually have one political point left. We could choose that to invest in growth, which will increase the rate that our economy grows at, but it also does reduce the ability of us to spend money on things like military technology, those kind of things. We've already committed one tech to the space race, so I think I feel okay investing in um, the economy. And that's kind of the last political action point that I have. So I don't know that I can do anything else. I know this is kind of like, oh my goodness, there's a lot here. It is not the most intuitive UI, as I've already said, uh, but let's go ahead and uh, like, can I do anything here? I, I guess I can. I could set up like a spy network in Brazil, go back to Europe. Um, I'm not really sure. Let's actually look at Asia, not, not Oceana, but let's go to Asia. So we've already got a plus, we've got a 10, which I believe is the maximum military power you can have in North Korea. Um, Looks like we've got 70 support. There's no Western ally support here. Espionage, we've got two to one in their country. South Korea, meanwhile, 10 allied units there, only five USSR units. So we can go ahead and spend five military sort of units to send them to South Korea to sort of represent the, the, the Korean War. And it spends us down from 30 to 25 military units. So it puts us there on par with the U.S., we can also use diplomats here to increase our sort of influence in South Korea. We can also es use espionage, so we can we've got ten spies essentially we can assign uh, there. And then like spies have the option of uh, sort of fomenting opposition or s fomenting support for the current government. We're going to go ahead and foment opposition. That costs us a spy as well. Uh, you can see here, eighty nine percent of the population is opposed. Uh, to the you know to the government there which can lead to a revolution i cannot uh, start a civil war it doesn't look like i've got that option um, i've got to do initiate civil war all neutral units will find on the side of the oh can i i don't know that i want to do that yet let's see how the war unfolds All units. Huh. Anyway, and then you kind of get like updates down here. So the USSR provides military support to revolutionaries in South Korea and anti-government riots erupt in all major cities of South Korea. So you've got that. Um, we do have military units. I don't know that there's anywhere else we want to deploy them. I don't think the U.S. is deploying military units anywhere else. I don't think that would kind of be bad in 1950. It's January of 1950, by the way. We may want to deploy some diplomats in like, so West Germany or East Germany is currently 40 to 10 in terms of diplomatic pressure in our favor. Opposition here is 70%. So we could use one of our diplomatic options here to increase loyalty to the current regime. And you can see here that causes that percentage to drop from 70 to 67 for the opposition. I don't know if anybody else is, has a higher opposition score. It doesn't look like it. We also might want to try and assign like diplomats to India, I suppose, since again, we we're going to try and win support for India. So we'll go ahead and assign one there. Um, and then we will also assign a spy. Indochina, meanwhile, there's two Russian units there. We're going to go ahead and increase that number to 10. We'll increase the diplomatic support there and then also increase an espionage unit here. Can I, so we only have a 40% of opposition here.
Uh, meanwhile, is there an Indochina option on here? There is. Oh, I don't have any more action points, so I can't do another treaty here. Increase my influence in Indonesia or Southeast Asia. Add a, add a spy there. Well, I want to send some spies to the U.S. too. I don't, I don't know that there's a lot we can do there, but should probably have some. And then maybe Western Europe as well. Just to try and prevent the U.S. from easily gaining more control over Western Europe. So, like, where... I suppose Yugoslavia would be important to support. Initiate a peaceful opposition would be should be higher. And do we need to put something in Finland? We've already got military units here. We'll add an espionage unit. Use our last diplomacy point. I think that's all I can do really right now. We can add more military units, but I'll probably need those for the Korean War. So we'll go ahead and end the turn. You can see it's, it is January of 1950. When I hit end turn, it'll become February of 1950. So there is now a war that's breaking out in uh, North and South Korea. So South Korea, you can see here, the score is, is 10 out of 10 in terms of military units committed. When you click on the military icon here, firepower bonus for the U.S. is 50 or is 10 out of uh, is 10. It looks like Reagan is the character we're playing against, but that will change every decade. So right now the game starts with Reagan. Obviously, it's not super historical with Reagan being in office in the 50s, but it's a game, right? It's kind of very feels very similar to like a card game type. Uh, structure here but you can see here they get a 10 firepower bonus for them um five for geographic indications well five for regional multipliers two for i guess naval tech so overall they've got 30 firepower here um the the 10 bonus and then the the 20 that they have from their units meanwhile the ussr has a 50 firepower bonus because we've got 20 for our naval units sort of tech 10 for uh, sort of air and then 10 for ground we have five we, so that gives us 40 there but then we have a bonus of five from stalin and a bonus of 10 from our cabinet ministers uh, which then brings that total up i guess it would technically be 55 i'm not sure where the reduction down by five comes from uh, but you can see here a 62 percent total firepower for both sides the higher the percentage the better winning outcome probability between the military units so we definitely have an advantage here. These units will take casualties over time, so you may need to send more reinforcements and more units in here, but for the moment, that doesn't look doesn't look necessary. The situation in North Korea strongly favors us. The situation in South Korea strongly favors us. So hopefully that conflict goes well and we can maintain control over both North Korea and then also gain control over South Korea. You can see here that our budget didn't really seem to get better. Like we started at 2,500, we spent a little bit of money um, I've got three diplomat and UN points, but I, that's not enough to do anything. Um, no more political global consequence points. So I can't really do anything with that. You can see sort of a summary of things. We sent troops to North Korea, South Korea, and then we also, uh, invested We're still waiting on that sort of diplomatic deal between the USSR and India. You can see if we go to, it doesn't look like anything happened on the tech side. I guess we spent one out of 50 required on the radar side. I still don't know where that is. Hmm. 
Um, let's increase our spending. Can I do that? I don't have the money. I don't have the consequences to do that. Okay. So that's that. I think we'll end the turn again quickly. And again, there's not like a ton of updates or other things like that, but the war is ongoing. So go ahead and we close the screen. Go back to Asia here. You can see it is now uh, March of 1950. The US strength or the, the Western Allies strength dropped from four to three in North Korea. We didn't lose any casualties. Meanwhile, in South Korea, it's still 10 and 10 for both sides. Okay. Opposition's 86%, so we could start a civil war. I don't really know how many neutral nations, neutral units there are. Oh, actually, I can't. I can't start it yet. I can use one of my two diplomats here and then increase opposition to the current regime. Or I, I suppose I could, but I don't actually have any points up here to do that, so never mind. But now that we've sort of progressed a few turns, you can go here and see we're still spending one on space. We're up to two out of 50 for the next item to be completed there. So I don't know how often you get more event points or things like that. If we go to the global consequences tab, you can see we have invested, we've done... I didn't, I didn't do that. So we influenced an American communism? Pretty sure I didn't choose that, but we're working on one for India. The U.S. is spending on what? I don't even see what the U.S. is spending on. I don't know if that's a fog of war thing or what, but uh, meanwhile, into April. We did lose a unit here in South Korea, so I can go ahead and assign another one. You can see I dropped from 17 to 16. I'm not sure if the enemy just keeps pouring more forces in, but you can see in North Korea, we've gotten two of the enemy units destroyed. And I, th I think you might only get new points once a year, like once global global influence points. So as we're into July and then August, you can see here zero out of eight. So North Korea has fallen to us. South Korea, the enemy is still fighting strong. We'll go ahead and increase opposition to us or to the Western allies in South Korea. and go to the global consequences tab there you go so we've got seven out of 50 and now you can see the progress on the baikonur cosmodrome here item here so once this unlocks on this radar item here you go down kind of the the left or lower portion here i don't know if we're so we're doing the chevron but that's not you know Our India. Okay. All right, so it is now a new year. We've got 32 points at the UN that we've sort of banked over time. We've also got an additional three political action points because we're through the first year. So we can do more stuff with that. Um, and then we've also got two more global consequence points. I really don't understand why the game gave two to American communism. I don't think I tried to do that, but seems like we did. 
Um, New Wave India and Vietnam War are the things I really want to spend the money on. You've got until 1960 and then these events go away. But three political action points here. Still 10 out of 10. We control North Korea pretty firmly. What else would we want to do though, like with our with our political action points? I mean, we could work on trying to lure Argent or uh, Yugoslavia to our side. So there's eight neutrals here. We could try and initiate a peaceful resolution revolution. If you do that. I don't know what these I guess we can go back to our budget. Use our points to increase the space race budget by one, and then we should also increase our new tech by one too. Uh, maybe also do some some technology research on, on other military things here. So we haven't really done anything on the air tech or naval tech. We're doing one on the on the nuke tech, two on set on uh, space stuff. Let's go ahead and do. Um, land tech one are we still fighting in korea it looks like it still working on the india trade deal okay well at least north korea should be secure from any potential risk we may lose in south korea and have them more firmly join against us. Germany's got a 67 opposition against us. I don't have any points to do anything with that though. What about the UN? Is there anything worth, worth doing there? I don't have enough points for that. Losing any men in South Korea, that's good. How's the how's the global consequences thing going? So the US is spending one on the Hungarian Revolution per turn? They're not investing a ton here. In twenty-four more days we'll have the American communism thing unlocked at the current rate. Fifty-five days or months on the Vietnam War. Jumping ahead three months at a time, probably not super smart, but. Um, it'd be nice if you could pull military units back, but I don't think you can from like a given state. All right, meanwhile, you can see GDP from 1950 to 51. Our GDP actually did go up from 2,500 to 2,700. I'm wondering if that's because we invested in the economy. We put one of our action points into it. Not entirely certain, but certainly possible. This develops cooperative industrialization project with Ireland. Okay. Uh, opposition... Something I didn't quite read that. I still can't get you more troops there. I also want to know what kind of casualties they're facing if we're supposed to have so much more firepower.
All right. So we can send peacekeepers somewhere in the UN now. Also, American communism is very close. We're six months away from completing that item. The Vietnam War is not very close, and the new wave India is not very close. But then there's also this Hungarian Revolution, which the US is 12 into, so they're nowhere near getting the 110. And we can stop them too. So if I were to invest a global influence point, my one versus their one would cancel each other out and they'd make no progress. Um, if I put two in, then we'd start making progress down our down our bar. Although actually, maybe it, I don't think it works that way. I think it's they keep getting their one, but we start getting one. So you you have to spend more to catch up. Um, I don't know why the AI is not spending more on these events. It feels like they should be. Meanwhile, I kind of feel like we should be going into the economy and investing more there. So can we go to the budget? Investing two in the space race, which great. Let's go ahead and invest one more in global GDP growth because it feels like once, you know, if we get a big enough lead in global GDP, that could be, that could be a big thing. Let's also go ahead and invest one more in one aviation and then one more in nuclear. Well, do two in the economy we'll do that i'm thinking long term the economy is going to be more important still work oh the india deal is done so that's good mm, iran's on our borders so we can do iran that feels smart Oh, I don't have any more of those points. I spent them all. But uh, back to the UN. We need a little bit more to condemn aggression. American communism is six months away. I don't know that I want to invest more there, but let's invest in the uh, Vietnam War. And then also the uh, India influence here. Did I get more units to deploy, by the way, to uh, South Korea? We're going to lose here. I don't quite know the rules on why we can or can't send more troops to South Korea, but it looks like we're kind of getting phased out there. So South Korea is probably going to hold. We could do peacekeeping to South Korea. And then that should end the war there. If it succeeds. Soviet and American governments, it's still here. Hmm. Right, Cosm Cosmodrome should be done next month. So we'll end this one more turn. And then if we go to the global consequences tab here, we've gotten American communism. So we get plus 30 Soviet influence in the US minus 100 for the US budget, which is nice. We're also about a third of a little more than a third of the way to the Vietnam War winning. And then new wave India. I don't know why these keep dropping. I don't know if the Americans are spending and that's why ours are dropping. Um, but we're not making much progress on new wave India. What's this? Would you like to support local nationalists in Poland? 
They're already part of our block, so no. I don't want to support folks who are Trying to, it would be nice to overthrow Yugoslavia's government and get them in bed with us. All right, so we're January 1953. We've got two more action points we can assign. We're about halfway to the Vietnam War being won. The Americans really aren't spending on anything. We'll spend two on New Way of India. How's our budget look? So we spent two percent of our two of our action points on GDP here. You can see it's now 1953. So we went up by 200 from 50 to 51. They went up by 158, but then they had an even bigger jump in 1952 and they passed us. We invested two percent this turn or two events this turn, so our GDP went up, but not quite as I guess a little quicker than them. We closed the gap a little bit, but we're still behind. Go ahead and invest another point in our uh, economy. Kind of keep that going. And then we also did succeed in the space race tech by unlocking the Cosmodrome here. So we got the first line in the uh, space tech, which now we can also invest in the sort of satellite tech. So this is sort of the on the ground radar stuff for space. And then this is the above ground you know like the the astronaut program so we'll invest one there and nuke tech is progressing nicely diplomacy military i suppose we should be investing like broadly you can see the cost too of each investment We're working on land tech with the T-55 specifically, which will influence like firepower in the war. And then uh, South Korea, that war ended. Uh, Poland is... Slavia. Okay. Anyway, I know that's a very basic initial look at this game, but uh, you know it's it's a game that again I highly recommend checking out the rules because UI is not super intuitive. Uh, but we're going to wrap this up here. We've been going for, for a bit over 30 minutes, and, and we're not going to make this a full hour-long video. But this is Arms Race 2, the Cold War era, a strategy Cold War game uh, that allows you to play through the Cold War as either the Soviets or as the Americans. Uh, and this is a game that came out today. We played the previous game, so I did want to take a look at this particular one. I think the space race and prioritizing funding can be interesting. I do think the game could use a bit more in terms of presentation to the player of what things are going on. It can feel a little bit slow or like you don't really know what you're doing until it's way too late in this game. Uh, that's been my experience. So that's something that I think could be, could be handled a bit better. Uh, but either way, let me know your thoughts here. In terms of what's next, you know what's coming tomorrow i think we might be doing a u-boat uh, or a destroyer u-boat hunter video since that game comes out tomorrow um if not then we will do another ultimate general american revolution game and if we do the destroyer u-boat commander video then we will almost certainly be doing a uh, a ultimate general american revolution game uh the following day so we will be getting back to that series but i did want to take a look at this little indie game just because we had played the previous version and uh you know we could we could try and play a little bit more and see how this goes. Let me know if you want to see more of this. We could always throw it into a live stream on Twitch also. I am debating um, doing like a member thing on YouTube. Um, more so so that I can like... Here's here's what, what tends to happen in these kind of series, guys. If I live stream something, I will typically chop the live stream up into parts and post it on YouTube. If I play things like this on the side, I will likewise um, off, often create more content than I have for like one video per day. I don't like posting more than one video per day because that leads to 
um, spam. It feels like spam to me. Um, and there are times where I go through having lots of content and times where I do not. You know, this isn't heavily edited stuff. It's mostly me playing through stuff and sharing my thoughts. So, I, you know, I, I, I'm conscious of not being the greatest YouTuber out there. Um, but I do think it might be interesting to post some videos as private. And that way I can give access to folks who really want it early without sort of sabotaging the whole like one video at a time type deal. So what we might end up doing is is posting some videos because I usually schedule the stuff like it's on YouTube anyway, um, days often, not all the time, but often it's on, on YouTube days before, you know, before it goes live. I, I just struggle with like, hey, it's out there on Twitch. If you want to see it, if I live stream something, you want to see it like you can go straight to Twitch. You don't have to wait for it to post on YouTube. So that's often an option. But a lot of folks don't go over to Twitch. And so then like, well, then it gets scheduled over a week or so on YouTube, but then it's just kind of sitting there and, you know, I've got a lot of comments from folks who are like, you know, when's the next video going to be up of Ultimate General American Revolution or any other game? And I'm just trying, I'm toying with ways that I could like let people have access to it if they really, really, really want it and can't wait. Um, so I don't know, maybe we'd do something like with memberships on YouTube. I I've never really done anything like that. I'm not super comfortable asking for money you know this is a side gig it's sort of something i do for fun um but the reason i say using the membership thing is the the tools of memberships allow anybody with a membership to be given access to a private video before it posts so it doesn't like sabotage the the youtube algorithm or it doesn't like throw five videos on youtube all at once for everybody and then they all feel like you're getting spammed but then if you're a member you can see it before other people do so like that might be an interesting way to use some of the tools that youtube has so that if you want access to videos early you can get it um but that and still sort of allow me to only release one video a day and sort of make stuff at my own pace i don't know just sort of musing on this sorry for that guys a little bit of how the sausage is made um we'll see you know, I've never done a Patreon either, so I, I, again, I don't feel super comfortable asking for money, but I, I don't have a way of doing like a, a free membership either, I don't think. I'll have to look into that. But uh, but anyway, guys, this is Arms uh, Race 2, The Cold War Era by Alenia Digital. Came out today. Hope you guys enjoy this video. Let me know your thoughts below. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.